Gant is a veteran of the fire department in Lancaster County, serving much of that time here at McDonald Green Volunteer Fire Department. A few days ago, he took to Facebook and posted, quote, Dear police, stop responding to these black neighborhoods. They will eventually kill each other, and the fake news won't have a story. I, I guess it was racially insensitive. I didn't mean it. I did not mean it that way. How, how would you mean it then, Gant? Un unpack it for us. Explain where the misunderstanding lies. Jesus. Everyone's so big and bad on Facebook, and then local news pulls up, and they're like, well, 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 what, what actually happened? So the nuance being missed here. Anyway, hey, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. It is Thursday, April 29th, 2021. Hit that like button. Definitely subscribe, a brand new subscriber for the month of April. At the end of the month, we're almost right there. So almost your last shot is going to win at random $5,000. Also, friendly reminder, you only got four days left to snag some of the awesome at shopdefranco.com and then it goes bye bye forever. Yeah, with that said, let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're going to talk about today, it's easily one of the most requested stories and, and it allows me to kind of share news, provide an update, but also maybe a, a clarification. So I've gotten a lot of requests to do an update on the Jeff Wittick, David Dobrik story. Jeff Wittick, of course, has his whole docuseries about how he got injured. Spoiler alert, David Dobrik accidentally swung him into a metal excavator, just d maiming his face. You know, in the last time we covered it, we talked about the revelation, how it's amazing that Dobrik didn't end up in jail because, I mean, this just oozes of criminal negligence. Since our last coverage, when it came out with another episode, some saying, why didn't you cover that? And it's because there's not really any sort of uh, legal or business angle to it. This is no shade towards those channels because they are in high demand, but this is not a primarily drama-based channel. If there's a business element to it, if there's a legal element to it, if there's a precedent-setting element to it, we're gonna cover it. But if it's just about like Jeff's feelings towards a friend and feeling betrayed and, and going through all these emotions, that's not something that I'm gonna cover on this show. That said, an interesting business element to this story has come out. We, I've seen a number of different reactions. And I touched on this interesting element to this story, which is I, I've seen some people criticizing Jeff Wittick for, for milking this situation. There, there's even a viral TikTok about it. Oh my God, he is milking this. Oh yeah, you're saying he's milking it? There's episodes to this, like what? Dude, if someone injures you, you're telling me you can't get some views off of that? You can get some views, but three episodes? And since then, we've seen outlets like TubeFilter putting out articles saying Jeff Wittick's Patreon account gets 37,000 supporters in 10 days with docuseries rollout. That's at least 2.2 million in annual revenue. They say at least because on the Patreon, they have subscriptions of $5, $10, $20 plus. With the reality being that in all likelihood, if all those people stay subscribed, the, the number is probably much larger than 2.2 million. And ultimately with this aspect of the story, what I would say is to, to those saying that Jeff Wittick is milking this situation, that he's taking advantage of it and profiteering off the situation, Fine. If anyone should be able to, it's him. Yes, I understand that Jeff Wittick is an adult who made a choice, but I still very much see him as the victim of this, this toxic situation. And if anyone should be able to benefit and grow from it, I think it should be him. I mean, it's part of the reason why I didn't run with leaked videos when it was kind of a known thing that he didn't want the stuff out there. And then you throw in YouTube age gating and cracking down on his content so he's not able to share his story to as many people. And yeah, the, the Patreon just makes sense. But hey, this is the Philip DeFranco Show. You don't have to agree with me. That's the story, my opinion. And then I'd love to know what you think, whether you agree or disagree with me. And then let's talk about our douchebag of the day, a man who has been called by local media the most hated man in Australia, 42-year-old Richard Pusey. And Richard, if you don't know, he was reportedly pulled over for speeding down a highway in his Porsche last April. And as four Victoria police officers prepared his arrest, the driver of a semi-trailer swerved out of its lane and struck all of them. Though Richard reportedly avoided getting injured because he had been urinating beside roadside bushes at the time. But it's what he did after the accident that has so many people hating him. He remained at the scene of the accident for several minutes to film the officers who had been hit. All four officers were killed, though experts believe that one who was pinned under the semi-trailer was likely alive as Pusey began filming. And for around three minutes, he walked around the crash. He zoomed in on injuries. He mocked the officers on video. His commentary included profanity and remarks like, he's smashed, justice, absolutely amazing and beautiful. When a bystander came to aid the officers and asked Richard to help, he replied, they're dead and continued filming. He reportedly made no attempts to assist them, then left the scene and drove home. With police ultimately finding that footage after his arrest and learned that he had shared it with other people. Ultimately, what we ended up seeing was Pusey later pleading guilty to outraging public decency, along with a drug possession and speeding offense, with him ultimately being sentenced to 10 months in prison, a $1,000 fine, and had his driver's license suspended for two years. Which is standout for a few reasons. One, because it's actually the first time the outraging public decency charge has been prosecuted in the state since 1963, with the sentencing judge saying that his conduct was heartless 
just cruel and disgraceful, though he noted that Poussey had a personality disorder, which might explain some of his behavior. And two, a lot of people think that this punishment is actually very small, especially because he's already spent nearly 300 days behind bars when the sentence was ordered. Though, actually, according to the New York Times, he is likely to remain in custody for unrelated matters. But still, families of the slain officers and much of the general public were furious over the sentencing, with many on social media calling it too lenient. Chief of the Victoria Police Association, Wayne Gatt, even saying, He is a worthless individual that lacks any human trait. Uh, each and every one of us will face our mortality one day. Uh, when his day comes, I hope that he faces the same coldness uh, and the same callousness with which he provided uh, my members uh, when they face this. But you also have others agreeing with and pointing to a piece by Rebecca Kavanaugh, a court reporter for the Herald Sun, which explained the sentencing and noted that being a downright despicable scumbag devoid of any redeeming features, unfortunately, isn't an offense. Though uh, of note here, as far as the biggest sentence, uh, you had the driver of the truck reportedly had actually been impaired by drugs and he was sleep deprived when his vehicle hit the officers. He ended up actually being sentenced to 22 years in prison after pleading guilty to four counts of culpable driving causing death, three charges of drug trafficking, and one count of possessing illicit drugs. But uh, ultimately with this story, I do want to know your thoughts regarding the sentencing of Richard Pousset. Where do you land on it? Do you think the sentence was right or no, it wasn't enough? Or do you think that he should not have been charged? Any and all thoughts and, and the reasons you have them, I'd love to know. But from that, let's take a second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Keeps. You know, two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35. And everyone's got that someone in their life, right? That brother, uncle, or friend dealing with hair loss. And if you don't want to go down that road, you don't have to just sit idly by and wait for it to happen to you too. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with their scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And Keeps offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products that are out there. So some of you may have actually already tried them before, but probably never at this price. And actually, for a limited time, you beautiful bastards can get 50% off your order, all without having to go to the doctor's office for your prescription, because with Keeps, you get these products delivered directly to your home. It is that easy. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash or just click that link in the description down below to receive 50% off your first order. Then for our daily which celebrity are people angry at today news, we had Miley Cyrus facing some backlash. And this in part because it was announced over the last weekend that Elon Musk would be hosting Saturday Night Live on May 8th with Miley as the musical guest. You know, Elon Musk can be a polarizing figure. Or some see and love him as the billionaire genius behind Tesla and SpaceX. But on the other hand, you have people saying, no, he's just kind of a, this egomaniacal billionaire. I mean, he denied the severity of the coronavirus pandemic early on. He spread misinformation on the topic. He prematurely opened Tesla factories amid lockdown. He called uh, that Thailand diver that was helping, you know, those kids trapped in a cave, a pedophile. Among other things, right? Some people just going, why are you giving a random billionaire access to hosting SNL, right? And this is just a quick scrub through Twitter. There's many issues. And even on a casual scrub, you can find some cast members kind of giving subtle criticisms. People like A.D. Bryan, who shared a tweet from Bernie Sanders on Instagram about how the 50 wealthiest Americans own more wealth than the bottom half of the country. As well as Bo and Yang responding to Elon's kind of weird tweet saying that he was going to find out just how live SNL really is. With Bowen writing, what the fuck does this even mean? But then with this, we saw kind of the, the outrage and anger get retargeted towards Miley Cyrus. And there's a part there because she engaged with Elon on Twitter, kind of talking about this wrecking ball parody. The people who don't like Elon Musk seeing this as kind of Miley Cyrus co-signing him as a person with tweets like, Miley, please, you don't have to pretend to like him. Miley, don't associate. And it's been really interesting to watch because I mean, this is probably the most backlash that SNL has got for a host since probably Trump. But what also comes with that is that this is probably the most that someone has talked about an upcoming SNL host in a long time. It really wouldn't surprise me if this was probably the most viewed episode of SNL this season with people kind of just tuning in to see what the hell this is even going to be. And hey, I guess we're going to see in a little over a week. Then, what's the weirdest way I could introduce this story? Mm, got it. You know how some people say you cannot put a dollar amount on a human life, but we know that not to be true for, for two reasons. One, if you've ever listened to enough uh, true crime docuseries or dramas, uh, you can pay people apparently a very minimal amount of money to kill other people, so you can put the dollar amount there. Or two, you can put a dollar amount on it based off of how much money you make other people. And that including Facebook, who just reported their quarterly earnings, and we learned that for every person on Facebook, you are worth nine dollars, unless you live in North America, in which case you are worth $48 a year. I should have clarified that. You're not some cheap $48 bitch. You're a $48 a dollar a year, bitch. Which is just an ungodly amount of money for Facebook, considering that across Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, Facebook says that they have 3.5 billion 
active monthly users. So it's not surprising to learn that their sales jumped 48% from 2020 to $26 billion, and of that, 97% were made up from ads. The profit as a company also doubled to $9.5 billion. But uh, funny enough, Facebook looks like child's play when you compare them to Google, who brought in $55 billion in sales, right? More than double Facebook's, with Google's profit more than doubling at $18 billion. And notably here, YouTube was a massive winner for Google with their sales jumping 49% to $6 billion. Right, just for comparison's sake, YouTube's quarterly sales alone is 85% of Netflix's quarterly total. So yeah. Also, because I introduced this story in such a weird, depressing way, I feel like I should end on a happy note. Or actually, maybe happy is not the right word. Maybe helpful. Well, I could not put a dollar amount on your life right now. Every single day we make choices that, that kind of show the world how much we value ourselves, what we do with our time, the people we keep around us, and probably a third thing as well. This is why my videos have jump cuts, because not everything comes to me in the moment. You know, the love that we have in our life that we allow ourselves to receive, that is one of the biggest indicators of how much we value ourselves. And if you're not surrounding yourself with people that lift you up, that's you subconsciously telling yourself, I'm not worth that much. Was that helpful? I don't know. Anyway, moving on. Then we should definitely mention that the US Food and Drug Administration announced this morning that it has begun the process of trying to ban menthol cigarettes as well as flavored cigars. With the agency's acting commissioner, Janet Woodcock, saying, with these actions, the FDA will help significantly reduce youth initiation, increase the chances of smoking cessation among current smokers, and address health disparities experienced by communities communities of color, low-income populations, and LGBTQ plus individuals, all of whom are far more likely to use these tobacco products. Which, according to the data, is true. It shows that the mint-flavored cigarettes are overwhelmingly used by young people and minorities, with research showing that 85% of black smokers use menthols compared to less than a third of white smokers. And connected to that, black men have the highest lung cancer death rate in the country. Which is why you have people like Carol McGruder of the African American Tobacco Control Leadership Council asking, the science is there, the data is there, so why are these products still on the market? And really Really, I mean, the answer there is because of a 2009 law. Because even though that law allowed the FDA to establish authority over tobacco products, meaning that it could ban flavored cigarettes, thanks to industry lobbyists, menthol was the one big exception. So instead, the law simply called for more research on menthols before anything could be done. And you know, for years, anti-smoking advocates and medical groups have continued to pressure the FDA to take action against menthol cigarettes. In fact, back in 2013, they even filed a petition urging the agency to ban the flavor, but the FDA never responded. And so because of that, last year, two anti-smoking groups sued the FDA, alleging that regulators had, quote, unreasonably delayed responding to the petition. The agency then had until today to respond, and yeah, they, they essentially did it last chance they could. But uh, still, do not expect this ban to actually happen overnight. For one, multiple FDA officials have attempted to move forward with a ban on menthol cigarettes several times since 2009, but each time they have faced steep pushback from big tobacco, Congress, and even competing political interests in both the Obama and Trump administrations. Right now, we're also seeing the American Civil Liberties Union pushing back, saying that it's concerned that this ban could foster an underground market that could disproportionately harm people of color due to over-policing. With the ACLU invoking both the names of Eric Garner, who of course was killed by a police officer after allegedly selling cigarettes outside of a convenience store, as well as George Floyd, who was murdered by a police officer after trying to pay for a pack of cigarettes with counterfeit money. And then two, let's say the ban goes through. It would likely face a stack of legal challenges, making it unlikely to be implemented for years. And, I mean, for big tobacco, this is a big meaningful fight. Menthol sales make up more than a third of cigarette sales in the country. And so a question I want to ask, and if you'll let me know if you're a smoker, you're a non-smoker, what are your thoughts on, on the possibility here? Do you love to see it? Do you hate to see it? Where do you land and why? Then we should definitely talk about updates around the killing of Ahmad Arbery. And it's been a while since we talked about it. So if you don't remember, Arbery was the 25 year old black man who was shot to death while jogging through a South Georgia neighborhood in February of last year. His death being one of many that fueled nationwide protests about racial justice. You know, with this killing, you had three men charged, 35 year old Travis McMichael, his father, 65 year old Gregory McMichael, and 51 year old William Bryant. And throughout this whole situation, the McMichaels had maintained that they thought that Arbery was a burglary suspect and they pursued him, claiming that Travis McMichael was acting in self-defense when he shot Arbery to death. And while Brian's attorney has argued that he committed no crime at all, he was kind of just there. But in addition to those three also facing separate state charges, including for murder, the three Georgia men have now been indicted on federal hate crime charges, with them each charged with one count of interference with rights and one count of attempted kidnapping. Travis and Gregory McMichael also charged with one count of using, carrying, and brandishing a firearm, with Travis in particular being accused of shooting Arbery. Right in a 
According to the Justice Department, the McMichaels allegedly armed themselves with firearms, got into a truck, and chased Arbery through the public streets of the neighborhood while yelling at him using their truck to cut his route off and threatening him with firearms. With Ryan then allegedly joining their chase, cutting off Arbery's route with his truck. The indictment saying that all three tried to unlawfully seize and confine Arbery by chasing after him in their trucks in an attempt to restrain him, restrict his free movement, corral and detain him against his will, and prevent his escape. And ultimately with this story, I mean, that, that video is, is like seared into my mind. My, my personal feelings, my opinion on this, I hope these three get, get prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. It's disgusting, a man was murdered. Once the video was released, obviously I can't show it here, but once the video was released, I felt like it completely undercut any sort of argument that they were they were operating within <laughs> what they thought was the law. But uh, for now, we will have to wait and see what happens next. And ultimately, with this story, and honestly, anything that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below, because that is the end of today's show. As always, thank you for watching, liking, subscribing, all the good stuff. If you're looking for more to watch, I got you covered right here with some more news or my latest podcast. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you next time.